All right, so uh, today we're going to talk about diseases of the uh, thoracic aorta. So starting with the anatomy of the thoracic aorta. So we have the aortic valve right there at the bottom at the junction with the left ventricle. And then we have the sinuses of Valsalva above that. And then above that, we have the sinotubular junction. So that's the area where the aorta just starts to narrow a little bit. And above the sinotubular junction, we have the ascending aorta. So that's the part of the aorta before we get to the great vessels. Then we have the proximal aortic arch. So the aortic arch is the part of the aorta where the great vessels come off. So we have proximal and distal aortic arch. So the isthmus is that part of the aorta just distal to the left subclavian artery just before the insertion of the ligamentum arteriosum. And then after that, we have the descending thoracic aorta. So that's the basic anatomy of the thoracic aorta. So here it is on an angiography, you, where you have these outpouchings. Those are the sinuses of Valsalva. Then we have the ascending aorta from there to the brachiocephalic artery. The sinotubular junction is the area that just starts to narrow right above the sinuses of Valsalva. And then we have the aortic arch where the great vessels come off. And the isthmus is between the left subclavian artery and the insertion of the ligamentum arteriosum, descending thoracic aorta after that. So uh, we'll start by talking about uh, the aortic acute aortic syndrome. So these are what the acute aortic syndromes are. The patients usually present clinically the same way. They usually present in chest with chest pain radiating to the back. And usually, uh, you know, the ER wants to do a lot of aortic dissection when patients present in that fashion. So we start with a chest radiograph. And obviously, we can see that the aorta, thoracic aorta, is markedly enlarged. So we suspect an aortic aneurysm. And here we have a nice big um, aortic aneurysm there. Uh, let's see, is there a way to move this? Now, the problem with aortic aneurysms is as the aorta starts to enlarge because of the law of Laplace, you start to develop more tension on the aortic wall. So that leads to progressive dilatation of the aorta. So the natural history for aortic aneurysms is once they get to a certain size is for them to continue to enlarge. There's been a recent change in the definition of what we call an aneurysm. So an aneurysm of the ascending aorta now is defined as greater than or equal to 4.5 centimeters in diameter. If it's between 4 and 4.4 centimeters, then we can refer to it as dilated. But once we get to 4.5, we can call it an aneurysm. There's very high risk of, of rupture. Once it gets to 5 centimeters and greater, if you're dealing with uh, uh, congenital syndromes like Marfan's, then 4.5 centimeters is the number uh, where the risk of rupture goes goes up. For the descending aorta, the aneurysm greater than three centimeters. A true aneurysm contains all layers of the aortic wall. A pseudo aneurysm, there is no intima within the wall of the aneurysm. So aneurysms can be described as fusiform, where we have symmetric radial rotation of the aorta, or saccular, where you have an outpouching from the aorta on one side. So when we see a saccular aneurysm, you might also suspect the mycotic aneurysms, as mycotic aneurysms tend to be saccular. And as we've said, uh, once the aorta enlarges more than five centimeters, especially when it gets to six centimeters, you really have a, really have a significant increase in the risk for rupture. On chest x-ray, we would suspect an aneurysm whenever we have a mass that we cannot separate from the aorta itself. So if we see that, then we would obviously suspect an aneurysm and easy diagnosis there on CT. And with these large aneurysms, it's not unusual to have large areas of thrombus that build up within the aneurysm. 
So we can get uh, mural thrombus. You can get calcification in the aortic wall or within the thrombus itself. So uh, we can get that. And if you start to if you start to see any thing that looks like soft tissue or hematoma outside of the aneurysm, then we need to suspect rupture. As in this case, it looks like there's some hematoma extending outside the aorta itself. On a non-contrast CT, if we have high, uh, high attenuation crescent, that could be a sign of imminent rupture. So if we see that, then we can suspect imminent rupture if you see high attenuation crescent like that. Here again, also another example where we have some crescent, but there's also hematoma there outside of the aorta. So that means that we have rupture in that case if we see that. Okay, you guys over here, do we have anything to say about this case? What, what are the findings? What, what do we have to say? Yeah, so the, well, one or all? Yeah, at least two, probably all three, right? So we have some enlargement here. And what about the aorta above that? Yeah, so it's okay, although it's a little bit bigger than, than the descending aorta there. So what would do this? What would, what would give you an appearance like that? Yeah, sure. So Marfan's and then the, the other term for that when we have dilatation of the ascending aorta that extends down to the aortic root, we call that the sign is the tulip bulb sign, right? But we call it an annulo aortic ectasia. All right. So here's the so in that particular patient, it's a very nice tulip bulb sign here from dilatation here of the ascending aorta extending down to the sinuses of Valsalva, nice tulip bulb sign. So this, of course, is associated with Marfan. So annual aortic ectasia, cystic medial necrosis causes progressive dilatation of the aorta extending down to the aortic annulus and proximal aorta, complications, dissection, aortic regurgitation, rupture. So uh, here's the sinotubular junction there, and then with annual aortic ectasia, you get dilatation of all of the sinuses of Valsalva, um, as opposed to just one sinus of Valsalva. So this can be associated with Marfan's and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So we'll have dilatation of the aorta extending down to the aortic root, and another complication of this is also aortic regurgitation. So whenever we get dilatation of the ascending aorta, especially if it involves the aortic annulus, the valves can uh, valves cannot completely close, the aortic valve cannot completely close, and so then you can have aortic valvular regurgitation. So that's a complication of annual aortic ectasia. So here's some more examples here. You have dilatation here going down to the sinuses of Valsalva, another example, very nice example. Um, and then here there's also dilatation of the ascending aorta above the sinus of Valsalva. So these are examples of annual aortic ectasia and nice tulip bulb sign there. The differential for aneurysms of the ascending aorta, of course, annual aortic ectasia, it can be Marfan's or other Danlos. Aortitis, vasculitis can give you aneurysms of the ascending aorta, like Takayasu's disease. Syphilis, we don't see that much anymore, but that can also give you aneurysms of the ascending aorta and trauma, including prior surgery. So that can also result in an aneurysm or really a pseudoaneurysm of the ascending aorta. Okay. Over at uh, St. Barnabas, what do we think of this case? So what do we call that? Well, that's, that's a sinus of Valsalva aneurysm, right? So here we have a sinus of Valsalva aneurysm, okay? So the sinuses of Valsalva, we talked about these guys. So these are the sinuses of Valsalva. So you have the, the cusps of the aortic valve. There's the non-coronary cusp, and the landmark for that is going to be the interatrial septum. Then you have the right cusp, and then you have the left, left cusp. And so that dilatation of the aorta right above the aortic valve, those are the sinuses of Valsalva. So they allow the aortic valve to open in systole without striking the aortic wall. So here you can see the aortic valve in systole. You see it allows some space for the aorta so it doesn't damage the aortic wall. 
or obstruct the coronary sinuses. And it's also said that the, the flow currents here within the sinuses of valve salvage during diastole promote closure of the aortic valve. So that seems to be the function of uh, the sinuses of valve salva there. Okay? So we can have sinus of valve salva aneurysms. Most involve the right sinus of valve salva. Uh, Non-coronary sinus involved in a small percentage, and the left sinus is very rare. To have an isolated aneurysm of the left sinus of valve salva is extremely rare. Okay. So sinus of Valsalva aneurysm, when we have enlargement there, usually congenital aneurysms give you enlargement of a single cusp. We saw some cases of annual aortic ectasia where that can involve enlargement of all the cusps. Uh, acquired uh, sinus Valsalva aneurysms, usually they affect the single cusp of the sinus of Valsalva. So for the congenital aneurysms of sinus of Valsalva, that might affect a single cusp. This could be from localized deficiency uh, of the uh, tissues there, of the aortic annulus. Can involve the posterior non-coronary cusp, usually less than four centimeters. And these can also be associated with ventricular septal defects. So the ventricular septal defects can result in prolapse of the sinus of Valsalva downward. And that can actually close the VSD, but can also result in regurgitation, aortic valvular regurgitation. So the most common cause of sinus valsalva aneurysm is congenital from localized deficiency. There's an example there where it involves the right sinus. We've said these can be associated with ventricular septal defects. And what happens with these high ventricular septal defects is that you can get prolapse of the sinus of valsalva down into the defect. And that results in enlargement, so you get a sinus of Valsalva aneurysm. That can actually help to close the defect, but it, it also can result in aortic valvular regurgitation as a complication of that. So these congenital sinus of Valsalva aneurysms can be associated with ventricular septal defects. Now, we've talked about Marfan's and Ehlers-Danlos, which can also give you uh, sinus of Valsalva aneurysms although usually with sinus of Valsalva aneurysms there, it involves all of the sinuses, and that's why we get this tulip bulb sign when we have all of the sinuses uh, involved with dilatation. And then they can also be from, we can also get these from infection, aortic root abscesses, syphilitic aortitis, TB, might also result as a complication of dissection, trauma, or vasculitis. So that might also give you uh, acquired, those are acquired causes of aneurysms of the sinus of Valsalva. Uh, so you guys over here, here's an aneurysm. Which sinus is that? Right. Yeah, so that's the right. You can see the right coronary artery coming off here. So there's a right sinus of Valsalva aneurysm here. Note its relationship there to the right ventricle. Okay. Uh, over at St. Barnabich, which sinus is involved here? Yeah, so this is an aneurysm of the left sinus of Valsalva. So these are actually extremely rare. Notice the relationship of this, though, to the left atrium, especially the left atrial appendage. Look how close that is to the left atrial appendage. Okay. All right. So you guys over here, what do you have to say about this case? What kind of view is this? What kind of study? What kind of view? Well, you should be able to tell me what kind of study this is. Bright blood, Bright blood SSFP. What view is this? Yeah, it's an outflow tract view. So this guy is left atrium, left ventricle, aorta. What do you think of the size of the chambers? So what's dilated? What chamber is dilated? The left, ventricle. the left ventricle, right. So here's the left ventricle. We can see the left ventricle is dilated. So uh, can we diagnose what the problem is? What's causing the left ventricular dilatation here? There is aortic valve regurge, right? You see the aortic regurge there. So what's the cause of the aortic regurge? 
well, the cusps aren't coming together completely, right? That's the cause of the regurgitation. But why? There's a big sinus of Valsalva aneurysm right there. See it? All right. So there's a sinus of Valsalva aneurysm here that's resulting in this complication of aortic valvular regurgitation. And that's why the left ventricle is dilated. Okay, so nice example of sinus of Valsalva aneurysm with the complication of aortic valve regurgitation. So uh, is, is there any, anybody here from Beth Israel? No? St. Barnabas, what do you have to say about this case? So, yeah, it's kind of what it says right here, right? There's a sun is of Al aneurysm on the right side, but why else am I showing you this? You guys see anything? So the catheter is where? In the ascending aorta, we're injecting contrast, right? So we see some dilatation here of that right sinus of Valsalva over here, but is there anything else funny looking? Yeah, the, the, well, not to the right corner, but there's contrast that's coming downward here, right? So it's, it's going down into a right-sided chamber. It's more than regurg. So what does that mean? So when you see contrast going down into the right atrium there, or rupture, right. So that's another complication of sinus of Alzheimer's aneurysm, is rupture. So with these, we talked about aortic regurgitation as a complication, but rupture can also occur. Uh, most uh, rupture, uh, and, and it will result in aortic regurgitation and left to right shunt. But since a lot of these come off the right cusp, rupture into the right ventricle, the posterior cusp tends to rupture into the, or non-coronary cusp tends to rupture into the right atrium. So rupture into the right-sided chambers is most common with these sinus of Alsav aneurysms just because of their location. So the posterior and the right cusps will rupture into the right-sided chambers. So the left, which is the most, which is the rarest of these sinus of Alzheimer's aneurysms, they tend to rupture into the left atrial appendage because of the proximity, okay? So ruptured sinus of Alzheimer's aneurysm, most, rupture, most will rupture into right-sided chambers because of their location. And so this is another complication of sinus of Alzheimer's aneurysm. Okay, so you guys over here, do we have anything to say about this case? Well, why, so why, what, what is the, what makes you think dissection here? Yeah, so here you have a calcification, here's the wall, right? So here's a calcification and actually look really hard. It does look like there's a flap here, okay? Even on this non-contrast CT. So you have a displaced intimal calcification. So a displaced intimal calcification is a sign, can be a sign of aortic dissection. And this is a case of aortic dissection. So let's talk about dissections. We're kind of familiar with these. Separation of the media by a stream of blood. So it goes out into there creating a false channel. And so we get this, we get this lumen and uh, this lumen out here with the false channels. You get a double lumen aorta and the flap, which is what we look for to make the diagnosis of dissection. So the flap is composed of intima and an inner portion of the media. So we all know about predisposing factors, hypertension, Marfan's, Turner's, Ehlers, Danvos, all of those are predisposing factors for dissection. Now there's a classification of intimal tears put out by Svensson. So the, the type one is a classic dissection with an intimal tear. So we're all kind of used to those, seeing those. Intramural hematoma uh, is a type two. With an intramural hematoma, the thinking is, is that even if we may not see the defect in the intima, that most of these occur because of a small defect in the intima, a small intimal tear. Then you can have an intimal tear 
uh, without a hematoma, those are or the so-called flapless acute aortic dissection. These are very hard to see on a CT scan, uh, but they, they can see those intraoperatively, see the intermotor intraoperatively. And we can have a penetrating aortic ulcer, and then we can have the, the type 5 is an iatrogenic or traumatic dissection. So those are the different, these are the classifications of intimal tears by Svensson. So when we talk about aortic dissections, we can classify them as acute or chronic. The acute dissections, less than two weeks old, chronic dissections, greater than two weeks old. 75% of deaths with dissection occur in the first two weeks. So uh, that's... Uh, that is important in terms of prognosis. Classification, the Stanford type A, dissection involves the ascending aorta, it's a type A, and these require surgery to prevent complications, and these are complications that can cause instant death, and that's why they require a immediate, uh, require the surgeon to address them immediately. If there's extension of dissection into the pericardium, you can have tamponade, if there's extension to the aortic valve, you can have aortic valve regurgitation, extension to the coronary arteries, uh, that can also result in myocardial infarction. So all these complications can result in instant death. So that's why these type A dissections need to be dealt with immediately. The type B, distal to the left subclavian artery, involving the descending aorta, these tend to be treated medically. Then there's a DeBakey classification, type 1 entire aorta, type 2 ascending aorta, type 3 if it involves the descending aorta. So with the DeBakey classification, type 1 involves ascending and descending, type 2 just the ascending, type 3 just the descending, and you can divide it into 3A and 3B depending on the extension. So the Stanford is the easiest to deal with where you just think about the ascending aorta, any dissection that involves the ascending aorta then would be classified as a type A using the Stanford classification. Now, when we evaluate dissections uh, on CT and then we, uh, in our report, what are the things that we want to talk about? Well, you want to describe the type of dissection. Is it a type A or a type B? The entry tear location, which is important, and we'll talk about that in a minute. The extent of the dissection, where does the dissection begin, where does it end? Great vessel involvement, does the flap extend into the great vessels off of the top of the aorta or into branch vessels? And then the abdominal aorta branches, which originate from the true lumen, which originate from the false lumen, is there any extension of dissection into branch vessels of the abdominal aorta? The size of the false lumen, uh, is the false lumen significantly compressing the true lumen? That can result in perfusion abnormalities, especially uh, within the abdomen to the bowel. Fenestrations, are there any other openings within the dissection flap except the entry tear? Because additional fenestrations tend to maintain patency of the false lumen. And then complications, is there uh, is there pericardial fusion? Are there any problems with renal perfusion? So these are the things you want to think about. So you create a kind of a checklist in your mind of these things to go through when you're dictating a report on, a, on an aortic dissection. We also want to take measurements. So we want to measure the aortic annulus. So that's down here where the, where the valve is. And these measurements in red are measurements that you should take on coronal views uh, because of the course of the aorta. See, it's going to be harder to take these on the axial views. Uh, it will um, um, artifactually kind of enlarge the measurement. So you don't want to take these particular measurements on axial views. Coronal views or, or sagittal views sometimes are best for these measurements. For the aortic annulus, sinus of Alsalva, and the ascending aorta, coronal views are best for those measurements. These other measurements you can take on your axial views, the measurement of the arch, the descending aorta, abdominal aorta, and you want to look for the maximum diameter, including the true and false lumen. So you want to include those measurements in your report when you're describing the dissection. So um, when we're going through this, so these measurements are measurements that you can take on the axial views. These measurements you don't want to take on the axial views, coronal views, might need sagittal views in some cases, but coronal views are usually best for these guys. Okay, so we talked about the classification. 
Now, your classic type B dissection, the flap kind of starts just distal to the left subclavian artery. And in this case, you can see that many times the entry tear is located distal to that. We can identify the entry tear now in many of these cases because our CT scanners are fast enough, even without cardiac gaining, to be able to, uh, to define the entry tear. But what tends to happen here is even if the entry tear is located distally, the dissection propagates forward and backwards. And of course, it could propagate forwards as far as it wants. But when it propagates backwards, these tend to stop right at the takeoff of the left subclavian artery. And that's why you get this classic appearance for these type B dissections. Even though the entry tear is located more distal, that proximal propagation stops at the origin of the subclavian artery. Okay? So it's a classic appearance of a type B dissection. Now, you guys over here, if I show you this case, what, kind, what type of dissection is this? Is this a type A or a type B? Well, where does the dissection go? It does go right. So what part of the aorta is this? Yeah, so this is the arch. Does it involve the ascending aorta? No. So this does not involve the ascending aorta, but it does involve the arch. So that, that's the question then. So with a dissection that involves the arch, is this a type A or a type B? And this would be a answer. This would be a type B. So this is, not, this is not treated surgically. So remember in, the, in, in that uh, Stanford classification, they described the, the type B as distal to the left subclavian, and then the type A is easy. But nobody talks about the arch, right, <laughs> in those classifications. So what happens when the dissection is involving the arch? Well, this is a, a type B uh, with arch involvement. So these are classified as type B. These are treated medically. So if you have a dissection that extends to the aortic arch, but not to the ascending aorta, then this dissection can be treated medically. So that is treated as a type B type of dissection, just to clear that up, okay? So that can be confusing. All right, what about this case? What, what kind of dissection is this? So we say this is an A because what? It involves the ascending aorta. Yeah, so this, this dissection does go to the ascending aorta, right? Um, do you see where the entry tear is? Yeah. You see it on the sagittal view? Yeah, so here's the entry tear over here. So would this be treated medically or surgically? Or what, what, what treatment do you think this patient should get? Why? See, so in the old days, we would have said, okay, it's a type A dissection and goes, it extends to the ascending aorta, so this should be treated, so this should be treated surgically. But the point of identifying the, the tear, the entry tear, is very important for these types of cases, all right? So no question that the dissection does extend to the ascending aorta, but the entry tear here is in the descending aorta. Okay. And so there is now this new classification of aortic dissections, which is put out by the Society for, by the Vascular Society and the Society of Thoracic Surgeons. And here it becomes important to identify the entry tear. So the, you don't have to memorize these numbers, but the aorta is divided into these different sections of the aorta. So the, the zero, that location is the ascending aorta, and then you have the aortic arch over here, and then you know, going down the, the descending aorta. So the way they will classify a dissection is to say where the entry tear is and the extent of the dissection. So in this case, if the entry tear is located in the ascending aorta, but extends all the way down to this, uh, this ninth location here, this would be a type A9. But what if the entry tear is in the descending aorta, as in this case, but it extends to the ascending aorta. Well, then it's classified by the location of the entry tear, type B, and then these subscripts here tell you the proximal extent and the distal extent. So something like this, where the entry tear is in the descending aorta, but it, but it goes to the ascending aorta and keeps going down to the descending aorta. So this would be classified as a type B 
subscript zero to nine. And the reason for that is the treatment that the patient would receive. Because for the treatment here, if they're able to close the entry tear, then the patient would not require surgery on the ascending aorta. And so this patient, the patient that I showed you, was, was treated with an endograft. And so the idea of the endograft is to close the entry tear, and here's what happens. So after stenting, you can see, so here's the stent. After the stenting, you can see what happens here to the ascending aorta. It gets smaller, and then three months later, it's completely healed. So this, this patient then did not require a sternotomy to actually go in there, repair the ascent, and put in a graft into the ascending aorta, which is probably what would have been done in the past. By identifying the entry tear and by closing the entry tear, they will allow the ascending aorta then to heal. And so this is now this new classification of dissection. So identifying the location of the entry tear is very important in these cases because it determines the management. Okay? So in this case, what will we say here? What kind of dissection is this? This is, this is an A, and do you see where the entry tear is? Let's go through it again. It goes down pretty far. You can see it actually extends <laughs> into, into the branch vessels there. Oh, ascending aorta. Yeah, so here you could see the entry tears in the ascending aorta. So this patient would require surgery. surgery right. So this patient would require surgery for treatment. Okay. So this tear is in the ascending aorta. You can see it's an extensive dissection. It actually goes down into the SMA. Is there another finding there on the last image that's illustrated? Yeah, so what's happening here in the left kidney, you can see that it's not enhancing as much of the right. The, um, the renal artery is coming off the false lumen, which is typical as these dissections extend down, it's typical for the false lumen to kind of spiral off to the left side. So the left renal artery uh, often comes off of the false lumen. So you can see these perfusion abnormalities within the left kidney. So this is something also for you to look for when you're uh, reading the dissection cases is for perf perfusion abnormalities within the kidneys. Okay, so that's our that's our discussion of these types of I is indeterminate, right? If you can't tell where the entry tear is, then it's an indeterminate dissection in terms of the classification. So on chest x-ray, if there's any acute enlargement of the aorta, that's where, of course, you would need to compare with prior films. Displaced intimal calcifications, very unreliable, but you can see the number on chest x-ray has got to be displaced by more than a centimeter before you can say it's displaced. But that is an extremely unreliable sign to make the diagnosis. Of, so, of course, we're going to do it by CT, we make the diagnosis by CT. We saw this case where even on a non-contrast CT sometimes, you can still see the displaced calcification in the interval flat. Okay? Um, in this particular case, what can we say about the dissection? Yeah, well, it is, it's going down to the ascending aorta. I haven't shown you the entry tear, so we, we, we don't see that. But it is involving the ascending aorta. Any other problems? It extends into the left subclavian. Yeah, it extends into the left subclavian artery. Is it extending into the brachiocephalic? Maybe. Hard to tell there. Um, what about the kidneys? The right kidney. Yeah, the right kidney. You can see that the attenuation of the right kidney is reduced compared to the left. So these are all important observations that you want to make when you're interpreting the CT scan. All right, so this is an obvious case of hemopericardium, right? So this is ruptured, right? So this dissection is ruptured. You see all this blood in the mediastinum coming down around, and then we have a hemopericardium there, and you can see that it's actually extending down. That hematoma extends down the descending thoracic aorta and can extend down into the abdominal aorta. Too. Okay, so ruptured type B dissection. Here you have the on non contrast, the high attenuation hematoma actually extending here into the pleural space. So this is a rupture uh, in this particular case of, of that dissection. So this patient has chest pain, and we can see the 
dissection there. Okay. So what type is this? Mm -hmm. And then when we look at the false lumen and the true lumen in this particular case, what do we notice? They're equally opacified. Is there anything else? About, what about the relative size? False is bigger. Yeah, the false is, is much larger than the true lumen here. And then when you when I look at the branch vessels here coming off the fall coming off the true lumen, in this case in the abdomen, what complication might this patient have? Yeah, and what do we call that? There, there's a term for that, and that's malperfusion syndrome, okay? So when you have a dissection that results in decreased perfusion, especially uh, of the, uh, these vessels here going to the bowel in the abdomen, uh, because the true lumen is being compressed by the false lumen, then that can result in, uh, uh, in, some, in ischemia, in bowel ischemia. And the treatment for that would be what? Yeah, so the, so the treatment for that would be a stent to maintain the, the patency and the flow through the true lumen, okay? So here's the post-stenting. And the other thing that can happen is when, when you do that is it can promote thrombosis of the false lumen, okay? Um, interestingly, if, if, you have, if you have vessels that are only being perfused by the false lumen and you have malperfusion, what would you do? What, what might they do for that? Remember now, the vessels are coming off the false lumen, but there's decreased blood flow going through those vessels. Fenestrations, right. So there they would actually put holes in the dissection flat to allow the blood flow to get to the, through the false lumen into those branch vessels that are coming off the false lumen. Okay. So here, here when we look down lower, look what happens to the dissection flap and what is it doing here? What's happening here? Well, what vessel is this over here? So that's the common iliac. So the dissection flap is doing what? Not just extending, but it's actually obstructing. Right? So you see how the dissection flap here is coming down and actually obstructing the right common iliac artery. Okay? So here it is, there it is, and you can see how there can be some obstruction there of the iliac artery. And here it is on this coronal reformatted view. Look at that. Right? See what's happening there. So this is called, you can have static and dynamic obstruction of the true lumen by the false lumen. So static obstruction is um, if the dissection actually extends into a branch vessel like that, and you can see how it can narrow the vessel and then result in obstruction. But dynamic obstruction, especially during systole, is when the false lumen enlarges and compresses, actually more, more in dias because the um, the false lumen tends to fill after the true lumen. So when the false lumen dilates there, it, it can compress the true lumen to the point where it actually starts to obstruct the branch vessels coming off of the true lumen. And you can also have a combination of static and dynamic obstruction if uh, the dissection extends into that, that branch vessel. So this can also be a problem where with progressive enlargement of the false lumen, where it tends to push the dissection flap over to the point where it can obstruct the branch vessel. And that's called dynamic obstruction. Okay. So here's, a, here's an unusual appearance of the dissection. So you see that dissection flap up there. And what's happening here is that the dissection actually was from the ascending aorta. And as it peeled off during systole, it's being pushed into the aortic arch. That's what you're seeing here. And you get this funny view. See that? Where it looks like there's a tunnel here right in the aortic arch. That's this guy over here. Okay? And so a complication of, of this, this kind of unusual thing here, is that it can obstruct the great vessels coming off of the arch. 
So the tear has been down here, and then that that flap has been torn off and during systole is actually being pushed out into the aortic arch. Here's another uh, unusual appearance. So here's a dissection again of the ascending aorta. And this guy down here is the aortic valve. This patient had, uh, had aortic valvular regurgitation as a complication of the dissection. <clears throat> and what was, what was happening here is that here's the, here's the dissection and it's being, it's being pushed during diastole, it's being pushed down into the aortic valve. Here's the aortic valve. You can see it's pushed down into the aortic valve and keeping the aortic valve from closing, resulting in uh, regurgitation, aortic valve regurgitation. So another unusual thing that we can see with dissection. Okay. So that's diagrammed here. So this tear in the ascending aorta, during systole it's pushed forward, but during diastole it's pushed backward down into the aortic valve. Okay, what is unusual about this dissection? Yeah, you can look at this image because it's nicely illustrated here too. See anything funny looking? Well, there's a there's a tear. You can see the tear here. What is this guy? What is that guy? See it? Well, it's not a P the patient doesn't have a PDA, but that that's that's the location, right? So what is this? Yeah. So this is actually extending into that ligamentum arterium or a ductus diverticulum. You, know, you can have a ductus diverticulum there. And in this case, because of the orientation of the dissection, it's coming off the false lumen, right? Can that be a problem? Presentation one month later. What's happened? Three years later. It's ruptured, right? So here, where you have this coming off the false lumen, you can get progressive enlargement. It's going to be an area of weakness there within the false lumen, right? Because because of that ductus diverticulum, and then now uh, over time, it's actually ruptured, and you can see how the hematoma is coming down now and actually going around the pulmonary arteries. So that thing ruptured. So that that's another important thing that you want to know if you have that, uh, if you notice that in your dissection. If we suspect dissection of the ascending aorta, well, what's the best study to do? Yeah, cardiac gated CT, because there's a lot of motion in the ascending aorta, and to identify the dissection flap, you'd be better off doing a cardiac gated CT. Now, we talked about the complications of dissection of the ascending aorta, the three that result in instant death, right? Those are the complications. So when it's not gated, you have a lot of motion artifact. When it is gated, then you don't have as much motion artifact. So at some places, the routine protocol for a dissection is a gated CT scan, just because if the dissection happens at the ascending aorta, you'll get motion-free images. So that's what the flap looks like when you're not gated. When it's gated, you can see the flap and the entry tear, and all those things are much better demonstrated. Okay. So here again, uh, sometimes, even with the gating, you may have to change your reconstruction windows to be able to look at the ascending aorta without uh, the uh, motion artifact. So you, you will have that option if you cardiac gate the study. Which coronary artery is most likely to be involved with dissection of the ascending aorta? If it extends down to the coronary artery? The answer is right coronary. Dissection flash, for whatever reason, tends to extend now close, closer to the right coronary artery. So the right coronary artery is more likely to be involved with dissection than the left coronary.
Uh, MRI, these can be very complicated because of slow flow and artifacts within the false lumen. So CT, of course, is the way to go when you're trying to make a uh, diagnosis of the aortic dissection. So there's CT, MR with contrast, showing you the dissection flat. So uh, one of the other things that you need to be able to do when you're, when you're dealing with uh, dissections is differentiating the true lumen from the false lumen. So in this particular example, uh, where is the false lumen and how can we tell? Guys, you see there are two lumens, one and two, right? So which one is the true lumen, which one is the false lumen, and how can you tell? Anybody? The smaller right one is true. Yeah, so usually the smaller lumen is the true lumen, the larger lumen is usually the false lumen. There's also another sign that's demonstrated here to differentiate the true lumen from the false lumen. Do you see what that other sign is? There's the beak sign. You see these acute angles in here, right? Also over here, right? So that, that, will, that will always occur on the false lumen side, right? So um, the, um, differentiating the true lumen from the false lumen, so there are various ways of doing it. Here's another example. Now what sign is demonstrated here that helps you differentiate the true lumen from the false lumen? Cobwebs, right? So you see these strands. So these are strands that occur in the false lumen. As the intima tears away, it leaves behind some strands sometimes. And those strands are called cobwebs. And those are also only, find, only found in the false lumen. So the, some of the most reliable signs, the big sign, the larger cross-sectional area, the false lumen, is usually larger. The big sign is found in the false lumen and cobwebs also usually found in the false lumen. So the big sign in the false lumen, this acute angle over here, sometimes you get a little thrombus in there, but this acute angle over here, that's found on the false lumen side, okay? And then these cobwebs, these are these strands that can occur within the false lumen. Also the false lumen is almost always larger than the true lumen. And so this represents the uh, media sheared off by the dissection, strands of media. So those are called cobwebs, okay? And we saw this ex nice example of cobwebs there in the case that we saw. Uh, another funny appearance you can get is as the dissection spirals around the arch that you can have what look like three lumens here. So the middle lumen is always the true lumen. This lumen that is actually spiraling around, that's the false lumen. So in the arch, if we see something like this, the middle will always be the true lumen, okay? All right, so what about this case? What is, what's the finding here? So here we have an intramural hematoma, and the sign for an intramural hematoma is called what? Crescent. Yeah, so it's a hyperdense crescent. So this is why when you're dealing with acute aortic syndromes that we include non-contrast CT um, in our protocols because you can have an intramural hematoma that will show up nicely on the non-contrast CT as this area of high attenuation representing bleeding within the wall of the aorta. And then after you give contrast, it can, it can look like this, but sometimes it might be hard to differentiate from atherosclerotic plaque, but you can see the hyperdense crescent, which is the sign of an intramural hematoma on your non-contrast team. Sometimes uh, if you narrow the windows, if you use liver windows, you can see the intramural hematoma a little bit better, so that helps. Other times, if you use thicker sections, sometimes five millimeter thick sections as opposed to 1.25s will make it stand out a little bit better. So there are various, various things you can do to see the intramural hematoma. So this probably results from a small tear within the intima and then the uh, bleeding that occurs within the wall of the aorta.
So in most cases, when they uh, when they pathologically examine the tissue, even though even though we don't see a dissection flap, in most cases there is an injury. There is a small injury to the intima that then results in hematoma forming within the wall of the aorta. So on non-contrast CT, we will see the high attenuation crescent. And then, on, of course, on con when we give contrast, it's going to be lower in attenuation than the, than the blood flow. Okay. Now, uh, this can also be seen on, on MRI, although it's much more difficult. And in this particular example, we have an intramural hematoma here that actually progressed to dissection in this particular patient six days later. And then sometimes they can actually heal. So it is important uh, to follow these. And again, they're, they're treated like dissections. So you can have the ones that involve the ascending aorta uh, are going to be more dangerous, and those patients may require surgery. But the ones that are uh, involve the uh, or do not involve the descending aorta can be treated medically. And so in those cases, sometimes it can heal, as in this example. But they do require follow-up because they can also get worse. In this particular example, we have an intramural hematoma, but we also have thickening of the wall of the pulmonary artery. So why is the wall of the pulmonary artery thickened? The aorta and the pulmonary arteries share an adventitia. Yeah, so the aorta and the pulmonary artery do share an adventitia here where they're touching. So what's happening here is bleeding in the wall of the aorta that's actually extending onto the into the wall of the pulmonary artery. So here's another example where on non-contrast we have high attenuation hematoma there on the wall of the aorta, and it's actually extended onto the pulmonary artery. And the bleeding can actually cause narrowing of the pulmonary artery. So the adventitia is shared where the uh, pulmonary artery and where the aorta touches the pulmonary artery. So bleeding from the aorta can extend into the wall of the pulmonary artery and can result in narrowing of the pulmonary artery because of extension of that hematoma. So here's an example where we have a dissection and uh, again as the uh, pulmonary artery and the aorta kind of spiral around each other. The contact uh, between the walls of the adventitia result in the bleeding extending onto the pulmonary artery. And then here you can actually see some really significant narrowing of the pulmonary artery. And then here these peribronchiolar uh, or these perihilar opacities represent peribronchovascular bleeding as the bleeding is actually extending out the connective tissue sheaths into the hilar areas. So extension of hematoma to the pulmonary artery is another complication that can occur from dissection. Another example where we have a full-blown dissection and a very large hematoma extending out to the pulmonary artery, causing significant narrowing of the pulmonary artery. And that can result in blood flow can actually cause right ventricular strain in these patients also. All right, so here we have two patients with intramural hematomas, one and two. Both of these have these uh, contrast collections that we can see. They look a little bit different. So um, what is the difference between these and what is the significance? The left is a pseudoanalysis of the vessels coming out of the aorta. With, and this the vessel left. is an intercostal artery, right? So that represents a pseudoaneurysm. That was because of the hematoma. There's lots of support for the vessel at that region and goes up. And then then this is it's not a penetrating. It's just like an ulcer of the. Yeah. So the, so there 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 are terms that are used to describe these. Does anybody know what the terms are? So we have, projection. yeah, so this one's called an ulcer-like projection. This one is called an intramural blood pool. And what's the significance? Which one is worse? The right one? Yeah, the ulcer-like projection is worse because uh, these need to be followed closely because this actually represents a defect in the intima that can go on and get worse, okay? So this is an intramural blood pool, so these can occur when you have bleeding within the wall of the aorta right here at the uh, where the vessel comes off, some of that blood actually, uh, so that hematoma gets in there and that results in that small aneurysm. Uh, 
in that location. Uh, even though it's a small aneurysm, it turns out that most of these usually resolve on their own. Okay, so that is an intramural blood pool. So, and you very commonly hear where we have the intercostal vessel coming off. And how do you tell them apart? Well, the, there's this small opening, right? So we have this very small opening, and then we have this blood pool within the hematoma, and then here we can see the vessel, uh, the branch vessel coming off the aorta. So this is not associated with a poor prognosis. This can resolve over time. As opposed to an ulcer-like projection, which, and other terms for this are focal intimal disruption or tiny intimal disruption. So these are terms that are used in the literature. So these tend to have a wider mouth. So here's one here that started out quite small. And then you can see 10 days later and one month later how it progressed and, and got bigger and actually goes on to can go on to form a pseudoaneurysm there. So uh, these may appear a few months later. They may not actually appear on the original CT as you're following these patients with intramural hematoma. And it represents a site of intimal disruption. It may enlarge over time associated with poor prognosis, and that's why these will require closer CT follow-up. Okay. All right, who's who's out there in virtual land? Any thoughts about this case? What are we looking at here? Nobody? Okay, back to you guys. What do we have here? Anybody else want to play? Um, Okay, take it, Rosie. I think it's an penetrating aortic ulcer. So what makes you say what makes you say that this is a penetrating aortic ulcer? There's uh, an outpouch. It's a irregular outpouching. Yeah. So there's outpouching of contrast that goes beyond the wall of the aorta. Okay. So that is beyond the wall of the aorta. And the second finding is what? What is this stuff? That's no plaque. Well, not, not plaque, but actually hematoma. So that's intramural hematoma. So the, the two things that you look for is uh, you look for the contrast, just like an ulcer on a GI study. So the contrast extends outside the contours of the aorta itself. And then this is in the wall of the aorta. Again, it's kind of outside the uh, contours of the aorta. This is in the wall of the aorta. That's an intramural hematoma. So these are also commonly associated with these penetrating aorta. Ulcer. So penetrating aortic ulcer represents ulceration that is continued on into, into the wall of the vessel and actually goes on to form kind of a pseudoaneurysm there. It's associated with hypertension and atherosclerosis. These tend to affect the descending thoracic aorta. So the descending thoracic aorta is more commonly affected with penetrating aortic ulcers. And it can present with symptoms like aortic dissection. And it does require follow-up because although they can heal, they can also progress and can progress to large pseudoaneurysm or even rupture of the aorta. So you get this ulceration or this collection of contrast extending outside the wall. But again, it's common for these to be associated with intramural hematoma around it, above and below uh, the actual outpouching. Okay. So this case over here, is this a penetrating aortic ulcer, this thing, yes or no? Because it does make a difference in terms of what's going to happen to this patient. So why don't you think that's a penetrating aortic ulcer? Yeah, so it, this does not, so you can see where the contour, where the wall of the aorta is, and this ulceration does not extend into the wall or beyond the contour of the aorta. So this is an ulcerated plaque, all right? So that's just an ulcerated plaque. This can go on if the ulcer progresses into the wall to form a penetrating aortic ulcer, but this is uh, an ulcerated plaque here. And same thing here. So we can have, when we have these plaques, we can have these irregular collections of contrast within the plaques, but it, as long as it, it is still within the confines of the normal aortic wall, uh, or you project where the aortic wall would be, then we have ulceration of a plaque. This is not a penetrating aortic ulcer, okay? So here's another example of a penetrating aortic ulcer, and this one, uh, you can see there it is there, hematoma here, and then as this is followed, it goes on to form this complex pseudoaneurysm, right? So therefore these things, and then 35 days later, much 
much worse. So these things do require follow-up to make sure that they are not progressing. Okay, um, now the the rarest of these kind of intimal uh, disruptions that we can see is an intimal tear without a mural hematoma. So also called flapless acute aorta or limited intimal tear or incomplete dissection. And what you have here is a tear in the intima that is uh, that exposes the media uh, or the adventitia, but there is no false lumen, there is no hematoma in the wall. So it's not a diagnosis that uh, you know, we routinely make on CT. Uh, if you have a cardiac gated CT, you can see how subtle that is. You might be able to make the uh, diagnosis, uh, but chances are we don't make this diagnosis by CT. So that little tiny thing there, there's no hematoma, just that little defect there within the intimal, intimal tear without a mural hematoma. That's what the path looks like on this thing over here. So it can occur in about 5% of patients with acute aortic syndrome, but as I've said, it's a very difficult diagnosis on CT unless you have cardiac bleeding. All right, so let's talk about uh, a few words about surgery. So here's a patient with a full-blown dissection here, ascending aorta, descending aorta. Um, here's the intimal tear, so this is a type A dissection. This does extend down near the aortic valve this patient, as it turned out, did have aortic valvular regurgitation associated with this dissection. You can see how close it comes to the right coronary artery here. Here's the right coronary artery. There's the dissection here. Okay. And as we've said, in most cases, dissections tend to come down closer to the right coronary artery than to the left. So what is done for this, if the aortic valve is involved, then the surgery that's done is a modified Bental surgery. And so what happens here is they will place a graft and the graft contains a prosthetic valve. So they replace the aortic valve with the graft. And this also involves reimplantation of the coronary arteries. So the coronary arteries they will take off and include this button of aorta with the coronary artery. And then they will anastomose that to the graft. If the aortic root, if the aortic valve is not involved, then they will place the graft above the insertion of the coronary artery. So the patient still has their native aortic valve, still has the normal insertion of the coronary arteries, and the graft just replaces the ascending aorta where the dissection is. Okay. The rest of the dissection remains in place. They're just replacing the ascending aorta to prevent the dissection from propagating proximally, and we've talked about the complications of that proximal propagation of dissection. And so postoperatively, this is why it's very important uh, whenever you're doing an aorta to include non-contrast images because we can see the graft material and the surgical material on the non-contrast skin. So the graft on a non-contrast skin is this, this rim of hyperattenuation, increased attenuation, that is the graft. Here's the aortic valve that was put in place. Again, here is the graft and you can see that the non-contrast images. Here's the graft, this high attenuation region. There's the uh, prosthetic valve that's part of the graft. And then you can also see the suture material, pledges, and other things that they have put in to reinforce anastomoses. And these we will see very nicely on your non-contrast images. So you don't want to be looking at a post-contrast image trying to figure out if this is extravasation or a normal collection of contrast. That's why I always do pre-contrast images in patients who've had surgery on the aorta. So you can easily find where the surgical material is. And then the post-operative appearance looks like this. So again, we have the surgical material here and the rest of the dissection will still be there. So we will still see the rest of the dissection. And then the, the kink here is normal. It's normal to have kinking like this within the graft. Okay, so that's a normal finding. Now, uh, what invariably happens is that after years of reading, and this happens with all kinds of studies, so you sit there and become complacent in reading these studies, and then you get a second year resident who's reading a study with you, sitting next to you, and now that they're a little bit more familiar with the anatomy, they start looking at stuff, as opposed to a first year who doesn't have that many questions because there's like a brain clog, they have so many questions, it's hard for questions to get out. And then the third year is worrying about the boards. The fourth year is worrying about the mammal fellowship. So it's the second year resident that usually says, is that an aneurysm of the coronary artery? 
right? And then you realize it's the first time you've actually noticed this, and then you start you know, trying to figure out, well, what are, what are we looking at? So this thing over here. Well, it, it turns out that, you know, whenever you have surgery on the ascending aorta and they have to reanastomose the coronary artery, you're looking at what happens after they reanastomose that coronary artery onto the graft. So this, this represents, remember the button I told you about, right? So back here, there's this button of the aorta that stays with the coronary artery, okay? And then that's what is anastomosed onto the graft. So what you're looking at is the coronary artery button, right? And then here on the non-contrast CT, that's actually the button of the surgical material that is used to anastomose that coronary artery button onto the ascending aorta. And then you can see here, again, surgical material on your non-contrast scan. So very important to have a non-contrast CT when you're looking at these post-operative patients, okay? Then there's other stuff, felt rings, felt pledgets. So all of that surgical material you don't want to mistake for abnormal collections of contrast. Now we can have all kinds of configurations of aortic arch grafts, so these come in all different shapes and sizes also. And then one peculiar type that sometimes comes up is an elephant trunk. And this is, this is this type of graph where it has this dangling portion that's hanging down into the descending aorta. And this is if they decide they want to go back in later on at a second surgical procedure to do surgery on the descending aorta to fix the descending thoracic aorta. They can't fix both in the same procedure because the patient would not survive such extensive surgery. So the first part here is, is placed to fix the ascending aorta and the arch, and then this part is left dangling down in the descending aorta, and they will go back at a second surgery when the patient's recovered from the first surgery to use this to fix the descending aorta. And it can have a funny appearance on CT. You'll see these rims uh, of the graft hanging down into the aorta. All right, so that is called an elephant trunk. It, it has shown up on exams. Okay. All right. So if I tell you this patient has history of recent aortic surgery, what do you have to tell me? Have anything to say? Nothing? Well, for fixing a dissection. Is there a problem here? All right, so there's hematoma, right? So we do see some hematoma around the ascending aorta, which, which you can which can be a normal finding in a fresh post-op patient. Anything else? There's what? There's contrast extravasation, yes. This person is actively bleeding from the anastomosis, right? So there's some contrast extravasation here. All right, that's an important finding in this case. All right, so there's extravasation of contrast here, which is causing that hematoma in this particular example. All right, so we want to notice that. So graft to hissense, if the graft falls apart, there'll be collections of contrast outside of where the graft should be. Okay, like this, and then, of course, there'll be hematoma. Here there's a, even dehiscence of the sternum because of the hematoma here. Graft infection, if we have abnormal collections of air, you shouldn't have air more than two weeks after surgery. So if we have a collection with air in it more than two weeks after surgery, then we have to worry about infection, okay? All right, so here is an MRA of the thoracic aorta. Anything to talk about here? Oh, what's abnormal? Yeah, the walls of the descending area look a little bit regu irregular. What, what about the branch vessels? What, what's peculiar about the branch vessels? They're what? Yeah, so the, the arch branches here are kind of diffusely narrow, right? So here is a little dilatation, but then they're narrowed. So we worry about vasculitis. What vasculitis would you think about here? Kiyasus, right? 
So Takayasu's vasculitis, also called aortic arch syndrome, middle aortic syndrome, other terms for it. It's the most common cause of coarctation of the aorta at an atypical site. So it can give you narrowing of the aorta in unusual locations. So it can be associated with both aneurysms and narrowing of branch vessels. So you can get both. You'll get irregularity, thickening of the walls with narrowing of the vessels and also aneurysms. So it has an inflammatory phase followed by a fibrotic process. It can involve all layers of the aorta. It can also involve the pulmonary artery. So it causes thickening of the aortic wall. It can cause narrowing with coarctation, occlusions with stenosis of branch vessels, aneurysms less frequently with Takayasu's aortitis. So it's divided into, well, we have different types. Type one is the arch and its branches, type two, the thoracal abdominal aorta and branches, type three, combination of one and two, and then type four is if you have pulmonary artery involvement. So even though we think of this as involving the aorta, Takayasu's can also involve the pulmonary arteries. So it can give you narrowing of the arch, it can give you aneurysms, it can give you saccular or fusiform aneurysms, and with dilatation of the aorta, you can also have aortic regurgitation. So here you have aneurysm of the aorta with narrowing of the branch vessels. Here you have narrowing of the branch vessels. And then here you have involvement of the pulmonary artery with this disease. Okay. Um, for vasculitis, one of the most key findings is thickening of the aortic wall. So we always look for thickening of the aortic wall. Here you can see progressive thickening as it dilates also. You get aneurysm dilatation four months later. So thickening of the wall is an important finding for vasculitis. So here on MR, you can also see all of that thickening of the aortic wall. So that's a finding that we look for for vasculitis. The thickening tends to occur before you get stenosis of the vessel. Now in this particular example, so first of all, what's, what's different between the two images and what's the significance of what we see? What's that? Yeah, so the one on the left is a black blood image, and then on the right we have a post-contrast image. What, what's the finding and what's the significance of the finding? There's thickening of the wall, right, and enhancement. So what's, what's the significance of this? The thickening of the wall we can see with vasculitis, right? But what's the significance of enhancement of the wall? Active disease, right. It implies that there's active disease, active, active inflammation. So when there's aortic wall enhancement, it's associated with active disease. These patients will have elevated ESR, elevated C-reactive protein. All right, so that's another finding that we can see with vasculitis. If you do MR, it's going to be more sensitive for enhancement of the vessel wall, uh, usually than CT. So aortitis, um, diseases that can give you aortitis, syphilitic aortitis, something we don't see very often anymore, that can involve the ascending aorta and give you aneurysms of the ascending aorta. But connective tissue diseases, uh, ankylosing spondylitis, relapsing polychondritis, giant cell aortitis, riders, all of these can be associated with aortitis. With syphilis, you can get aneurysms and calcification of the aorta, especially the ascending aorta. Okay, so here's a patient who's had a motor vehicle accident, okay, and what is it, of course, we're all going to be concerned about? Why the the medium is not a very tough call on a chest radiograph, and that's why uh, we don't go by the chest radiograph anymore. These patients go to CT. And so the diagnosis is traumatic aortic injury, right? So here you have a pseudoaneurysm and here we have hematoma, disruption to the intima, bleeding outside of the aorta. So that's a traumatic aortic injury. Nicely demonstrated here also in the volume rendered images where you have that pseudoaneurysm. Right? So there have been different terms for this, you know, aortic rupture, transection, laceration, but uh, traumatic aortic injury is, is the term that kind of encompasses all of these things that you can see. Most of these occur at the aortic isthmus right here at the uh, insertion or near the insertion of the ligamentum arteriosum. And that's where you look for the disruption. So there are different theories for that. Uh, the one I like to think about, although it, it may not be the actual explanation, but with rapid deceleration injuries with motor vehicle accidents, the ligamentum pulls then 
on this part of the aorta and results in the tear. It's a nice way to think about it, a nice way to remember it, although that may not be the actual explanation. Um, we can see hematoma. Uh, the point is, is that these patients may be stable at the time that they present to the emergency room, but they are at very high risk for rupture. And that's why it's an important diagnosis to make. If there's widening of the mediastinum, then that implies that there's already hematoma. There's bleeding outside of the aorta into the mediastinum. Um, there are all these findings that are described as far as the radiograph, findings associated with aortic injury, but none, you know, widening of the mediastinum is not specific, but kind of the one that, that most of us will look for. But again, any patient who has had that mechanism of injury deserves a CT scan. We're not going to go by the chest radiograph. Okay. On CT, the indirect sign is mediastinal hematoma. That's the first thing we look for. We look for a bleeding within the mediastinum. Uh, now, not all mediastinal hematomas, though, are caused by aortic injury. A venous injury can also give you mediastinal hematoma. But there are direct signs of injury in almost all cases if there's mediastinal hematoma because of aortic or arterial injury, you will see an abnormality within the particular vessel. You will see an abnormality within the aorta. So we'll look for contrast extravasation, intimal flaps, and then pseudoaneurysm, these other findings uh, associated with the injury. CT is about 100% sensitive, 87% um, specific, because as I've said, some mediastinal hematomas can occur from venous bleeding. So not all mediastinal hematomas are from aortic injury. So big mediastinal hematoma, in almost all cases, you will see the area of injury uh, in the aorta on the CT. So look very carefully for that. What happens if the injury is missed? Well, if the patient is fortunate and it doesn't go on the rupture, the patient may go on to develop a pseudoaneurysm in that location. So this is 30 years after the patient's injury has gone on to develop pseudoaneurysm. So if we see aneurysms in that location, the important question to ask is, is there some history of aortic injury, of not, I mean, you're not going to get the history of aortic injury, but is there a history of a serious motor vehicle accident in the patient's past? Other findings, sometimes hematoma can extend down to the abdominal aorta. So if for some reason you're doing an abdominal CT on a trauma patient and you happen to notice hematoma around the abdominal aorta, well, it could represent extension of hematoma from the chest. So you want to go back and image the thoracic aorta to make sure you're not missing a uh, thoracic aortic injury. So again, the second year resident who is sitting next to you reading the case points to this and says, oh, wow, is that an aortic injury? What are you going to say? So that's a ductus diverticulum, right? And again, you don't notice it until you start looking for this stuff, right? You've, you're kind of blown by this in all your chest CT scan. So how do you differentiate a ductus diverticulum from an aortic injury? Location. Well, both occur in the same location, right? So that, that's not going to help you that much. Hematoma. You, hematoma is a very important thing. So you look for any evidence of hematoma first, right? Is there any hematoma outside of that? You look for the contour. This has a very smooth contour as opposed to the, the as opposed to the injuries, which are somewhat more irregular. And also injuries are associated with intimal disruption. All right. So you look for abnormalities of the intima. All right. So you don't want to call uh, you don't want to call that an aortic injury. You don't want this patient to get a stent, right? So another patient who's had a motor vehicle accident, again you have a very, very observe, observant second year resident who points to this and says, what's going on here? Okay. And what are you going to say? Yeah, so this is called minimal aortic injury. So here all you have is an intimal irregularity. There's no hematoma in the wall. There's no, there's nothing wrong with the rest of the aorta. There's no bleeding outside of the vessel. So how can this be treated? What's the significance? How can this be treated? Yeah, so this can be treated conservatively. This can be treated with a follow-up CT to see if it gets worse or better. This may resolve on its own, okay? Except over here, I'm telling you, these patients are going to get stent grafts over here, <laughs> whatever you call any aortic injury. But in the literature, these things can be followed conservatively. All right. So that is minimal aortic injury. 
So he, that's when we have an intimal flap or a clot or a small thrombus along the intima. There is no irregularity of the aortic contour. There's no intramural hematoma, no mediastinal hematoma, and this can be treated, as far as the literature tells us, non-operatively. So the grades of traumatic aortic injury, grade one, minimal aortic injury, where it's just injury to the intima. Grade two is if, where we have intramural hematoma. Grade three, when we have pseudoaneurysm and grade four, when you actually have rupture and bleeding that is extending outside of the aorta. Okay. So here's a patient who had a motor vehicle accident. So is this a ductus diverticulum, or is this something we need to be more worried about? Any thoughts? What? So, well, this time there's thickening around it, right? That's hematoma. Right? So that's hematoma. So we can't call that a ductus diverticulum. This is traumatic aortic injury in this case. Right? So that's hematoma around it. So this is injury. Okay? So you want to be able to differentiate between injury and diverticulum. So this will be treated with, how does this get treated? Stent, right, endograft. So it gets treated with an endograft. There it is. And you can see uh, the idea is to cover the area of injury so that the high pressure blood, it's not exposed to the high pressure in the blood where it can go on to rupture. Okay. So here's our patient with a traumatic aortic injury, intramural hematoma. You can see all the irregularity. And it gets treated with a stent. There is the stent. And here's post-stent images, right? So, let's go back to this for a second. So, look at these branch vessels, right? This guy is what? The no, that's not the common variety. That's the... To the left of the carotid is the, the last one. It's a cleaver, right? Here's the left common so what's happened to the subclavian? Thrombose. Thrombose. Why? Because there was no penetration. Well, because the graft is covering it, right? So is the graft covering the left common carotid, which would not be a good idea. Here's your thrombosis in the left subclavian. Is the graft covering the left common carotid? Yes. You say no. Why not? Actually, it's covering the flow from the contralateral side. So, the proximal prongs, right? The way these graphs are constructed. Uh, see, the proximal prongs are not covered. So, whatever vessel, whatever vessel these proximal prongs go over, is not going to be covered. All right. So, be careful about that. The rest of it can be covered. If you have any question, you know, ask the thoracic or ask the vascular surgeon what they did. But the rest of this is covered, and that's why the subclavian is covered, and the patient developed thrombosis there in the subclavian, but the common carotid is not. So if you see these prongs going over, um, ideally, you know, you don't want to cover the subclavian. So if you see the prongs over the subclavian, the proximal prongs, it's not really in risk of being obstructed, because there is no, there is no in internal covering over that portion of the graft. Okay? So, this patient, after the endograph, you can see we don't see the pseudoaneurysm anymore. It's a good result, right? Because it has been isolated from the blood pool. That's the point of putting in the graft. So the preoperative planning for this, I've given this to you, you know, in your handout. These are all the things that you need to look at, make sure there are no anomalous arch vessels, the course of the common carotid, vertebral, uh, the circle of Willis, the basal vertebral system, in case you're going to wind up in case the surgeon has to cover the subclavian artery. Uh, are there any grafts, you know, coming off the subclavian artery, right? Internal mammary artery graft. You don't want to cover it in that case, right? The injury location relative to the subclavian, you'd, you'd want some clearance. You know, ideally you want the injury, you know, you, you need a landing zone about 1.5 to 2 centimeters away from the subclavian. So how close is the injury to the subclavian artery? Will it require coverage of the subclavian artery? And then the length of the injury on the oblique view, 
And then other things that you're also going to be looking at is um, the diameter of the aorta because the graft has to be sized to the aorta. Usually they're slightly oversized. Okay. Is there any angulation in the aortic arch that will result in poor opposition, uh, opposition of the graft uh, to the aorta, especially when it curves around? Right? The caliber of the access site, the femoral artery, because they have to be able to get the graft in there through the femoral artery. And then is there any atherosclerotic calcification, stenosis, tortuosity of access vessels that is going to impede their access to the vessel? In terms of follow-up, these patients will get a CT follow-up before discharge, three to six months, one year, and then annual follow-up to look at to look at the stent. So uh, these are the, the graphs. The lumen should be pained without sharp angulation. The, the graph should be opposed to the aortic wall throughout the course of the graft, and it should not migrate. Pseudoaneurysm should be stable in size and excluded from contrast flow. So you want really good opposition of the graft material to the aortic wall as you see in that example over there. Complications, endoleak, endograft collapse, covering branch vessels, infection, failure, failure to exclude the pseudoaneurysm if you haven't adequately covered the pseudoaneurysm, and then of course access site complications from the procedure itself. So here is an endoleak, and you do have to know your types of endoleaks. What type of endoleak is this? Type 1A, right, so type 1A is a occurs at the proximal part of the graft. So these endoleaks, type 1, inadequate seal. Type 1A is if it's proximal. Type 1B, if the distal seal is not good. Type 2 is if, there, if there's leakage from collateral vessels that then fill the uh, outside of the graft. Type 3, if there's fracture or disruption of the graft structure. Type 4 is porosity of the graft fabric and then so here are the types of endoleaks type five is so-called endotension don't ask me I don't know what that means but that's a type five <laughs> all right um, what's what's wrong with the graft here anything wrong with this graft there's a what no, no, that, no, that, that, that's, that's, that just has to do. With it. That's, that's okay. That's not it. So one, you know, we talked about coverage of the subclavian, but the, the proximal prongs, we said, is probably okay. But what about this? See, this part of the graft is not opposed to the wall, right? So, could that lead to a complication? And the answer is yes, because what, what happens is, remember, the arterial flow is hitting this. So over time, this could, this could then wind up dissecting the graft off of the aortic wall. So this is called a bird beak deformity. So not in all cases is this bad, but this can go on. So the, in some cases, this can be associated with complications of the graft. So coverage of the subclavian here, but if it's the proximal prong, it's probably okay. But here along the lesser curvature, you don't have opposition of the graft to the aortic wall. That's called a bird beak deformity, and then that can result in complications of the graft. Okay. Um, if there's going to be coverage of the subclavian artery, the complications of that, well, you want to avoid covering it. So it would be nice if you had a good amount of dif distance between the injury and the subclavian artery. But that can result in a type 2 endoleak. Because if you cover if you cover the subclavian artery, retrograde flow from the subclavian again can then fill this part outside of the graft. So if they cover the subclavian, that can result as a, in an endoleak. That's why in some cases what they might do if they're covering the subclavian is to occlude the proximal part of the subclavian and then to do a carotid to subclavian bypass above above that. Okay, so that they still perfuse the subclavian, but then by by occluding the proximal part of the subclavian, they avoid the complication of an endoleak with flow coming down the subclavian around the endograft. Okay. So, most patients actually do well after uh, occluding the subclavian. Right? If it's the, uh, of course, it can result in stroke and claudication, um, especially if it's the dominant side for the repeat room. 
Um, endograft with proximal fenestration, so there are some more, uh, some variations in the graft where some will have fenestrations that allow you to place it and still maintain patency of the subclavian artery. Okay. All right, so this patient has an obvious abnormality here of the aorta. And then here on CT, we have this. What do we think is going on here? Yeah, there's intramural hematoma in this part of the aorta that's sticking out. So what are you going to call this? Pseudoaneurysm or big penetrating aortic ulcer. Right? Okay, so here it is. There is that. There is this hematoma. And it was, there it is on volume render, very dramatic. Okay. And so this was treated with stenting. Did it work? No. Why not? What do you see? Yeah, there's still an end, there's still a big endo leak here, right? So there's still contrast that's extending outside of the graft. So there it is on your volume render view. Now, another thing you can do now with CT, if you take the time to do it, is you can actually look at the inside of the vessel, virtual angioscopy with CT. So we can actually look at the uh, graft material there from the inside of the vessel, looking at the stem material itself and the configuration of it. That's what we've done here. Okay. So there's, there's the hole there in this particular case. And then here we can get up close and personal and look right through, right through the hole to show you. So virtual angioscopy now is also possible with CT. It takes a lot of time. If you have the time and the patience, we can do this also. Okay. Is that more sensitive than axials because of the artifact? It's easier, it's easier to see, but you know, to, to know where to go, you have to look at your axials very carefully, okay? Because you, you know where the site of the leak is, right, from the axials, and so that, that, that's the part that you're going to concentrate on. And okay, you can imagine how the surgeons would love to see pictures like that, too. So it's nice. All right, so that is our discussion for today. You guys have any questions?